Welcome to our Bible study. This is Lesson 24 of the Bible Prophecy and the Book of Revelation by Dr. Bill Waddell. He said Revelation 20. We're going to be considering the main topic tonight. And uh, I know I've said this morning something about the judgment seat of God. Actually, the main topic tonight is not going to be that. It's going to be the millennial reign of Christ. What is the millennial reign of Christ? It means Christ is going to reign for a millennia. How long is that? It's a thousand years. Uh, predicted in multiple places in the scripture, no better than what we find here in chapter 20. So let's take a look, and it, it's, it is a controversial topic to a certain degree because there, is, there, is, uh, there have been three historical positions of the church on this. And I'm going to tell you what mine is, and I'm going to make it clear why I don't go with the other ones. You're going to have to decide what yours, yours is, but nonetheless, here we go. Again, John starts the way he starts a lot of these things. I saw. Remember, all the way through here, this has been stuff that he's been seeing. It wasn't some kind of, uh, like he fell asleep and woke up with a document in front of him. No, he's seeing these things and then recording them. How does he do this? I don't know. God enables him to do this. I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key of the abyss. That's the word, the word common, common, commonly used in the New Testament. Uh, it's the word in Greek, abuso. Uh, it's the same place where when Jesus greets the demoniac, if you remember on the Sea of Galilee, he comes and, the, and these demons say, do not throw us into the abuso. So it's the same spot. It's called otherwise the bottom. It's referred to as the bottomless fit. It's called Tartarus in Greek. Uh, it's called Sheol in Hebrew. It's considered to be the center of the earth. It's bottomless because there is no, every, if you're at the center of the earth, every direction is up. See what I'm saying? So it's bottomless, this abuso this abyss. The key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold of the dragon, the old, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. How long was a thousand years? It's a thousand years. Actually, a biblical year is 360 days, not 365. So 360 times a thousand days, if you want to get literal, and that's, I think we should be very much literal. So a thousand years. So is the devil bound today? Let's ask that question. So if he is, his chain is too long, I would say. Okay, he seems to be super active. Now, he most definitely is not, and we're going to see why he's not, but we're going to get to that uh, in just a second. So he binds him for a thousand years and threw him into the abyss and shut it over him and sealed it over him so that he should not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. Here we have that same thousand-year period laid out. It just repeats itself three different times in this chapter as if we can't get the point. Until... Until the thousand years were completed, and after these things, he must be released for a short time. Why, why release him? You tell me why he was here in the first place, and I'll tell you why he's here in the second place. About that, I'll make a deal with you. Now, actually, I know why he, he's released, and I know why he was here in the first place, but nonetheless, uh, why release him? Why not leave him there? Because, 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 well, bottom line, God wants to do it that way, but we'll, we'll see the reason why. God has reasons for everything that he does. Now, the millennial, this chapter 20, this whole millennial reign of Christ, and it goes on. We're going to be seeing this here. Not just for a millennial will, the, millennial will the devil be bound, but also Christ will be reigning on the current earth. What do I mean by that? I mean an unadjusted earth. Not a, not a new heavens and a new earth, earth, but the current earth. That is, with the current environmental problems, the current structures. Of course, we go through this seven-year cataclysmic events of the, of the tribulation, and that's going to alter some things. It's going to alter the population by half, uh, less than half probably. But at the end, we just read chapter 19, we see Jesus returns on this white horse with the armies, that's, who you, that's, you, that's you and I, riding with him. He comes to destroy the armies of the beast and the false prophet. The beast and the false prophet, not his armies, but those two unique individuals are thrown into hell. They become the first residents in hell. Devil is not there. He's never been there. He is headed there. But even in this case, notice he's not thrown in hell. That's the outer darkness, place that burns with fire and brimstone. He's thrown into the abuso, which is down there. So there's two places. They're not the same. And as we're going to see, this place, this abuso, this Hades, is actually going to be extracted from the earth in the new heavens and new earth and thrown also into the outer darkness along with the devil, the false prophet, and everyone whose name's not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So this, but this whole issue of millenn this millennial reign of Christ, this thousand-year reign of Christ on the earth. So the Bible, we're going to see, li states literally that Jesus today, here's, let's follow, let's follow the, the, the thought process here. Today, because he became a man in time 2,000 years ago, 
a Jewish man in particular, namely Jesus, because he became a man 2,000 years ago, died and resurrected as a man, in particular a Jewish man, he ascended into heaven. When he ascended into heaven, he turned into American, right? No. <laughs> he ascended live, bodily, into heaven so that today we can say confidently that on the throne of God sits a Jewish man. Is that clear? That's what the Bible clearly teaches. This same Jewish man is going to return to earth to claim that which he paid for when he died and resurrected. He didn't just buy those who would repent and turn to Christ. He also bought ev all property, all holdings, heaven and earth, he laid claim to and paid for with his death, burial, resurrection, and ultimately his ascension. He's as the same way, as it says in, in Acts chapter 1, the same way that he ascended, he will also descend in the same spot. So the Mount of Olives, and we, we read that last time, how it's going to be split in half and how these things are going to happen to Jerusalem and all that. So, so this guy, Jesus, is going to be returning back to, to reign on the earth, the current earth, under the current circumstances, albeit greatly altered through seven years of tribulation. For a thousand years, you know, there's been three camps historically, and I'm not sure how you were raised or what church you were raised in, but part of my responsibility is to set you guys straight. Is that okay? And straight isn't, hear me, isn't what I believe or my conviction. Straight is just what the Bible says. And I adjust my beliefs all the time. I'll, you'll hear me talk if you stay here with me long enough. I know I said that a couple years ago, and I disagree with it now because I believe this, because of my further research has proven, proven it thus and such. And I don't mind being corrected at all. In fact, I love it because I hate being wrong. But what I hate even worse is thinking that I'm right, but, but it being wrong. So don't let me go like that, okay? So first of all, is what is the position is called premillennialism. That would be me. That has also historically been the church, the early church, especially the, the age of the apostles and the early church, first 300 years. There was no theolo theological position other than a literal reign of Jesus, a premillennial reign, that Jesus is going to return premillennium, going to rid the earth of the devil, and as in this case, he's going to reign over the earth for a thousand years. That's the position of the early church. After that 300 years, then started coming the dominance of what we know today as the Roman Catholic Church. Part of the Roman Catholic Church issues was that they began to gain great holdings in the world, like physical holdings. They became possessors of tremendous amount of property, land, money, buildings, facilities, other things, and they had a problem with Jesus coming back and removing from the world those who owned it. Because they were thinking, wait a minute, we're the ones who owned it. So they changed, their theology changed, and they became what's called amillennialists. An amillennialist is the same as like an, uh, an atheist. The word, the letter A in front of anything says whatever follows, they don't believe exists. An atheist, a theist is a person that believes in God. An atheist believes there isn't a God. A millennialist, that's be me, believes in a thousand year reign of Christ. An amillennialist believes there's no millennial reign of Christ, that it's not literal. And they take this in most of this chapter almost exclusively uh, of, as just simply being figurative. So we're going to get to that. We're going to talk about that, what, why they believe that. We're also going to talk about post-millennialism. Post-millennialists or millennial believe in the millennium. They believe it started when Christ resurrected. They believe it started when the church was anointed with the Holy Spirit, began to preach and teach. That, that was the beginning of the millennium and the, the responsibility, according to the teaching, the responsibility of the church is basically to take over the world. We are going to be so effective, this is what they teach, so effective in converting the world, the world's literally going to become Christian. And then when it becomes Christian, Jesus is going to return to reign over it. It's not that they don't believe that Jesus is not going to reign on the earth. They just believe the millennium started way back there. And part of their reasoning is it's because they're driven by a different force. And part of that force is what's called kingdom, I refer to, refer to at least as kingdom now theology, which holds, they basically hold that they've replaced Israel's uh, promises to receive their promises, and it's most, most, most especially health and wealth. God never promises the church any kind of health and wealth. If, you have, if you're in the church and have health and wealth, you have it because God wanted to bless you, but it's not because God promised it to us. God said in this world you will have tribulation. So here, if you're getting that, you're kind of more in line with what Jesus promised. Anything else is just by the grace of God. Israel, on the other hand, they're, if they were obedient, they were healthy and wealthy. Very clear. The post-millennial position wants that health and wealth. They want to be able to preach it. And so what they did is they formed this whole theology around it, which also includes this whole issue of this 
post-millennialism. In other words, Jesus, the, the millennium has already started, and we're, we're post, we're behind it. It's already started, we're in the middle of it today. Uh, pretty easily uh, refuted just simply because of the criterion it takes for the millennium to come. One is a seven-year tribulation in which the whole, uh, half the population of the planet is decimated. We don't have that. Where is that? How can we be in the millennium? That never happened. So we're waiting for that to happen. We can't have the millennium until we have that, the seven-year cataclysmic events, right? We haven't had that. Like I said, pretty easily refuted. Of course, my position is premillennial. In other words, I believe that Jesus will reign on the earth for a thousand years, literally. I'm honestly not smart enough to know, know any better than that. I hope you'll forgive me. I'm not smart enough to know anything better than the, what the Bible says is what it says. And I would suggest to you that same position. No offense, but you're not any smart enough either. Because as soon as we start conjecturing, and I know I've said this a lot, but as soon as we start conjecturing about the Bible where the Bible doesn't allow us to conjecture. Now, when we get to a place like, for instance, chapter 12, where it says there was a sign in heaven, we automatically know, okay, this is not literal. This is symbolic. This is figurative. But when it doesn't give us permission, like, for instance, in chapter 20, when it doesn't start off and say a sign, oh, what does John say? I saw. I saw this. Okay, well, then he saw it. Then that's what it is. So we're talking about a literal devil. We're talking about a literal chain. We're talking about a little bo literal bottomless pit. We're talking about a literal thousand years. There's not another way accurately to read it. And I would say that not just for the sense of, we just want to take this chapter and say, well, it could be symbols because a lot of the Revelation is symbols. And I would say, ah, okay. The problem with it is, is that Revelation 20 doesn't stand by itself. It stands with the rest of Revelation, first of all. And there's, like I said, it's, it just, Revelation is chopped up between that which is literal and that which is figurative. And also, Revelation in general stands, stands in the context of the entire Scriptures. And I'm telling you, you're going to take the, the, the non-literal position on the millennial reign of Christ, you've got a royal problem with a lot of the Bible. You're going to have to write off a bunch of it. And now, I, in my, if you'll forgive me, now you've become God deciding what's real and what isn't. And I don't really trust that. So, as I've said before, God does not turn over the, the decisions of how things go to a sheep. He does not trust us. Why would you trust a sheep? There's not a reason to. Sheep are so easily deceived. So, anyway, my position and, and part of the problem with this, especially the odd millennial position, that there is no thousand year of Christ, reign of Christ, is that there's so many prophecies that have to be fulfilled that could not be fulfilled in any other context. Consider this one. You're familiar with this one. We read it every Christmas. It's not a Christmas. It's not a Christmas verse. It's a millennium verse. Notice. For a child we born, this is Israel speaking. They're so excited. A child's going to be born, and the great news about this child is what? Son will be given, and what? The government, not a heavenly government, earthly government, will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. They expected correctly an earthly reign of the Messiah. That's why they had such an issue when Jesus comes and doesn't take over the Romans. When, when is, in fact, you hear Jesus after his resurrection being questioned by his own disciples to that effect. Lord, will you at this time, so he's resurrected, he's died resurrected, he's about to ascend, but they don't know that. Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Why would they ask a question like that? Because it says that literally in their scriptures. They have a very good reason to expect that. And notice Jesus doesn't differ with their expectation he differs with them trying to make a timeline out of it. Notice, the only thing he corrects is their timeline issue. It's not for you to know the times or seasons. Don't try to make a timeline out of this. i got a job for you guys to do, which the Father's put in his own authority. Don't worry about this. Notice, he doesn't say it's not going to happen. He, he effectively says it is going to happen. Don't worry about the time period, though. I'm going to take care of that. The Father's going to take care of that. It's not your business to know that stuff. So they were not incorrectly translating the Old Testament. They were correctly translating the Old Testament as a literal reign of the Messiah on the earth. Jesus doesn't differ with that. So you say that there's no literal reign of Jesus on the earth, and I'm going to say to you, because I don't, I'm not sure where you get that, because there's so much that has to be fulfilled. So Jesus was wrong here? Nor are you wrong, because it can't be both. Notice the promise to Mary. Here's the angel coming to Mary, and Mary says, how can this be that a virgin conceive, yada, yada. And the angel tells him other things about this child that or her th other things about this child that's been conceived to her. He will be great. Become the son of the Most High. Those are literal things, aren't they? And the Lord will give him the throne of his father, David. David didn't ever reign in heaven. 
David was a Jewish king, by the way, had the title of Messiah. He was not only Jewish, he was also a Jerusalem king. So now we have not just an ancestry, we have a location for the reign of Jesus. It's going to be on earth in Jerusalem. Not just Israel, though, the whole planet. That's what we have here in William. Again, you've got to explain this stuff away. So you don't say this is literal, you feel people feel free. And here's, here's what I've noticed about guys, and, and no offense, in most, a lot of the guys that I know, their amillennial position actually is a popular position among a lot of Baptist preachers. And I'll, I'll tell you my opinion why, and it might be totally wrong, but you can just take it for what it's worth, you know, take it with a grain of salt. I could do everything else I say. My, my opinion of these guys is they don't do their homework. They hold that position because it's easy. Because the, most of them that I know that hold that position are also solid on the gospel. They're solid on other places in the scripture. It's not that they don't believe in a literal interpretation of the scriptures. But they, they speak um, too quickly about stuff that they've never spent a lot of time studying. And I would just say this to all those who are listening. I know I've got an audience of probably 10,000 preachers listening to me right now. <laughs> if you're not going to study and do your best... Shut your mouth until you know something. But don't spout off about things that you don't know, because that's what you really, in my opinion, and I, you know, I, I, the ones I know that have, have this position, I love them, and I, they, they hold to, they, they're, they're defenders of the gospel in every way, and it's not a, this is not an issue that should divide us, I don't believe at all. But I do have an issue with it, because because we should be very careful about how we handle Scripture, and we can't just go wrong in one area and kind of slough it off. Well, we need to be serious about it, and if we're not going to be serious about it, let us not talk about it then. So, take it for what it's worth. So, so there you go. Jesus is going to reign on an earthly throne, and you can't get clearer than that. By the way, it's the same scenario in Zechariah 14. We're not going to take time to read it. We read part of it last time. Zechariah 14 is this huge battle on the earth, for Jerusalem, Jesus slaughters everybody, and then he reigns on the earth from Jerusalem. It's the same scenario as you have in Revelation. So you've got to write that off somehow. It's not literal. I'm not sure how you're going to do that. Plus, you have multitudes of promises to Israel that are yet to be fulfilled. For instance, the Palestinian covenant. You know, the Palestinian covenant means that Israel's going to inherit the land over there. It is their place. But they have never owned or occupied or controlled the whole thing. God told Abraham, he told David, he told multiple prophets that they were going to own everything from the Euphrates River to the Wadi or the River of Egypt. So all, everything from halfway of the Sinai Peninsula, all, the, all of Syria, all of Lebanon, most of Jordan, and part of Iraq. They've never owned that. All the way to the border, their northern and western border, is the Euphrates River. They've never done that. Not even under Solomon, not under, not under David. Is God going to keep his promises or not? He is. In fact, it divides this land up in that area. If you'll, if you'll read the book of Ezekiel, it divides this land up all the way from the Euphrates River, all the way south of the Wadi of Egypt. Because why? Because God is very serious. He's already parceled it out. He's not going to be thwarted from the things he's planned to do. These are all literal things. So again, these promises that are to Israel, the promises to Israel, for instance, to be restored to their land without a curse or an enemy. Today, Israel's in their land, are they not? They've been there for going on 70 years, right? But are they without curse and without enemy? So what we have of Israel today is not what's God's promise for them. Now, obviously, they're there because God wants them to be there, but it, here's, here's, here's just some, a smattering of examples. Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel 36, 37, 38, 39, they all say that Israel's going to be returned to the land completely at peace with no enemies. When is that? Not until the millennium, unless you don't take it seriously or don't take it literally. You've got to explain all these chapters, I mean literal chapters in the Bible. Uh, these are also, it's also predicted in Isaiah chapter 2, the millennium, millennial reign of Christ and the conditions of it. Isaiah 2, Isaiah 4, Isaiah 11, Isaiah 12, 30, 35, 60, 61, 66. This is all the notes. I'm going to re require reading for you until next time. Jeremiah 23, 32, Ezekiel 40 through 48. It's all about the millennial reign of Christ. Um, let's go look at a couple of these places. Isaiah 11. Let's run over there. Hold your spot. Isaiah 11, verse 1. 
verses 6 through 9. And these are just descriptives of this reign. We call the millennial reign of Christ. Let's just, let's back up. He's talking about this, this conquering branch. Then the shoot will spring, chapter 11 begins with, a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse. Jesse is the, the immediate ancestor of David, right? He's talking about the, this this reign of kings that descends from David. And a branch from his roots will bear fruit. And the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. This is what Jesus quotes when he stands in his own synagogue there in, in Nazareth. says, today this has been fulfilled in your hearing. The Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. And he will not judge by what his eyes see, but he will make decisions by what his ears hear. Nor, nor will he make decisions by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he will judge the poor. When did he do that when he was on this earth? 33 years. I mean, he got a few confrontations with that. Basically, he was taken up by just dying, paying for our sins. There's coming a day when he's going to be in a position where he's going to have to decide between, over the poor, and that's what he's going to do. He will decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. Hello, when was that? And he will strike the earth with a rod of his mouth. When was that? See, you're going to have to write off a lot of Bible if you say Jesus isn't coming to reign for a thousand years, literal reign. With the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked, and the righteous will be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his, of his waist. And then watch this, and the wolf will dwell with the lamb. When has that happened? That doesn't happen. I don't know if you've got lambs, but don't put a wolf in there with them. <laughs> Something's happening in the future that's going to change the conditions of what we know, environmentally and every other way. The leopard will lie down with the kid, that is a goat. The calf and young lion and the fatling will run together. A little boy will lead them. Also, the cow and the bear will graze, and their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like an ox. When is this? This has not happened. This is Garden of Eden level stuff. But it's not happened since. But it is happening in the future. The nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra. Not advisable. But it's going to happen. The weaned child will put his hand in the viper's den. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. When has that happened? It's not. Not yet. But it will, and it will come about on that day that the nations will resort to the root of Jesse, the same one referred to in verse 1, this Messiah, this, this figure, descendant of David, who will stand as a signal to the peoples, and his resting place will be glorious. And then it will happen on that day that the Lord will again recover the second time to his land, the remnant of his people, who again, he will cover them from all these different lands, and it goes on and on. But again, here we have this, this story, if you will, of what's going to happen in the millennial kingdom of Christ. Ezekiel, go there. You've got to write all this stuff off if you don't believe in the literal reign of Christ on earth. You're going to have to write it all off somehow, and I'm not sure how you're going to do that, but good luck. Ezekiel 34. Ezekiel 34, verse 20. Therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, Behold, I, even I will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep, because you push with the side and shoulder and thrust at the weak with your horns until you have scattered them abroad. He's referring to the leaders of Israel and how they treated the people that were underneath them. Therefore, I will deliver my flock... And they will no longer be a prey, and I will judge between one sheep and another. Then I will set over them one, of, one shepherd, my servant David. Now, I don't know if y'all have noticed, but David's been dead a long time. So how's David gonna, how is David going to do this from the grave, unless he's not in the grave anymore? So, you, so here we have a requirement, David being resurrected. I, I haven't noticed him being on news or anything, have y'all? So it hasn't happened yet. But it will Either that or God's blowing smoke, which I don't think he does. And he will feed them, and he will, uh, he will feed them and, and, him, and himself, and their, he, he himself will be their shepherd, and I, the Lord, will be their God, and I, my ser and my servant David, will be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. When did this happen? Has it happened yet? But it's got to happen. There's got to be a time for that. That's coming. It's called the millennial reign of Christ. 
Uh, I will make a covenant of peace with them and eliminate harmful beasts from the land. Only the Israel's got all kinds of snakes, got all kinds of problems even today, so that they may live securely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods, and I will make them make it a place, make them and the places around my hill a blessing, and I will cause showers to come down on their seasons. In their season, and there shall be showers of blessings. Also, the tree of the field will yield its fruit, and the earth will yield its increase, and they will be secure in their own land. Has it happened, guys? This hasn't been true for Israel since the, since the time when the kings reigned in Jerusalem. We're talking about 3,000 years they've not had this. Then they will know that I am the Lord when I have broken the bars of their yoke and I have delivered them from the hand of those who enslaved them. They will no longer be prey to nations. Hasn't happened in 3,000 years. They're under dominion of the United Nations right now for sure. The beasts of the earth will not devour them and they will live security and no one will make them afraid. Go to Israel today. There's bomb craters pretty much everywhere. There's bullet holes and walls of buildings that you go to because it's just a common thing over there. Not a reason not to go over there with us, by the way, guys. Much more dangerous, much more dangerous in Brownsville, Tom. Much more dangerous, even though you can't carry a gun like you can in Brownsville. I know that, but nonetheless, the right people are armed over there. And I will establish them at a renowned planting place, and they will not again be victims of famine in the land. They will not endure the insults of nations anymore. Have you not watched the news? This is not happening. But it's going to happen. But God's going to have to instill this because there's going to be a Jewish king that reigns over all the earth, and you're not going to speak against him, and certainly not against his people. Then they will know that I am the Lord their God, and I am with them, that they, and that they, the house of Israel, are my people, declares the Lord. And so it goes on. Uh, chapter 37, let's take one more spot of Ezekiel. Again, either, either on the one hand God's blowing smoke, and just says a bunch of hoopla that he doesn't intend to fulfill. Or on the other hand, God is saying exactly what he means and exactly how it's going to carry out. You've got to decide what you're going to do with that. Chapter 37, verse 21. By the way, the whole, whole chapter is about the millennial reign of Christ, but, but 21, let's focus on that just briefly here. 21 through 28. And I say to them, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will take the sons of Israel from among the nations where they have gone, and I will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. Now that seemingly has happened today. You go to Israel today, you have Jews that have, that have been born and raised, or their ancestors have been born and raised and been for, for more than a thousand years living in other countries. And they're now being gathered into Israel. But notice the rest of this disqualifies it for being today. And I will make them one nation in the land on the mountains of Israel, and one little king will be king over them, and they will no longer be two nations. They will no longer be divided into two kingdoms. They will no longer defile themselves with idols. They're doing that all the time right now over there. They, uh, the typical Jew, Israeli Jew is an atheist. So this is not today. It's going to happen, but it's not today. Or with their detestable things or with any of their transgressions, but I will deliver them from their... Uh, and from all their dwelling places in which they have sinned, and they will I will cleanse them, they will be my people, I will be their God. And my servant David will be king over there. We have again, it requires the resurrection of David. Now, I haven't seen him on the news. This hasn't happened yet. They will all have one shepherd. They will walk in my ordinances and keep my statutes and observe them, and they shall live on the land that I gave to Jacob, my servant, in which my fa their fathers, your fathers lived, and they will live on it. And they will, uh, they and their sons and their sons' sons forever. And David, my servant, shall be prince over. And he keeps saying that. And I will make a covenant of peace with them, and it will be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them and set my sanctuary in their midst forever. And my dwelling place also will be with them. And I will be their God. They will be my people. And the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel when, I san when my sanctuary is in, the midst, in their midst forever. So it's not just a thousand years. It's just a thousand years under the current situation of the earth and God's going to be remaking all the earth so so again you if your position isn't a literal position with regards to the millennial reign of Christ you've got a whole lot of other scripture to deal with it's not just chapter 20 you got a lot of splaining to do as they say a lot of splaining to splain away because man and some stuff that's very very clear and uh, but but again why why do I hold to a literal position on the scriptures because as soon as we start trusting what's going on between our ears and the, the, we start unraveling the scriptures that way, there's no end to the way it unravels. So if, I, if I'm free to say 
something that doesn't allow me to say it's not literal like chapter 20. But I feel free to say that. What keeps me from saying it's not literal somewhere else when it very clearly is? I, if I had the power to do it there, I've got the power to do it over here. Why not? Why not? So again, don't trust what's happening between your ears. Trust what the Scripture says. Let it say what it says. Uh, ha struggle with it. It's okay. Not a problem. But, but let it be what it is. So, so it, again, and back, back to the whole post-millennial reign of Christ. So if the devil, if the devil is bound today, which is what it takes for it to be the millennium, one of the many, it's the way the whole chapter starts off, then why do we have verses like, for instance, in, in Ephesians chapter 6, resist to stand strong or resist the schemes of the devil if we don't have a devil? Or, or, or for instance, this one in, in 1 Peter. Uh, what's, what's the use of this if there isn't a devil? I mean, if, this is the millenn if we're in the millennium already, be of sober spirit, be on the alert, your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion. It was Paul, I mean, Peter was just uninformed of what was really happening. Or are we uninformed about what's really happening? That's a literal devil. He's literally here. He's not been bound. He's going to be. That's the reign of Christ. Not until then. He's still deceiving, as it says there in chapter 3, all the nations. Look at, let's back to Revelation. We're getting into more literal stuff. It's going to happen literally. In the reign of Christ for a thousand years. Paul, again, John says, I saw. So I saw an angel, and he comes down and shows me this. And then, I mean, grabs the devil and puts him in this bottomless pit with a chain around him. And he goes on, verse 4, I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them. And judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of the testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God, because that happens, especially during these seven-year tribulation where the Antichrist is ruling. And because of the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image, this is very specifically the tribulation group, right? And had not received the mark upon their foreheads and upon their hands. He says, I saw these people and they came to life and reigned with Christ. How long? A thousand years. Why? Because that's what he's going to do. And those who are a part of this, as we're going to see, first resurrection, are going to be all a part of that. that, that means, that's you too. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. We're not going to go to the verses, but those that are included in the resurrection, the first resurrection, or a special group. First of all, Jesus is the first fruits of that resurrection. He was, he was resurrected on the feast, on the day of the feast of first fruits. It's where the priest would go in and wave a sheaf of, of wheat or grain or whatever in front of the altar. And it was an offering of sacrifice, the, the best, the first out of the land would go to God, and it was symbolic, and it was also a prayer. So you offer this first fruit, saying, God, we pray that you would bless the rest of the harvest, that it would come through. Jesus was resurrected on that. That's always the Sunday after Passover. Jesus was resurrected on that very day for a very specific reason. He was fulfilling that promise. He's the first fruits. He's the wave offering before God, guaranteeing the whole rest of the harvest. Jesus is just one. But there is a whole, there's a multitude of others who are going to also be resurrected because of his resurrection. We are also going to be resurrected. That includes who's going to make this first resurrection? For Jesus is the first fruits. All who believed, in, believed prior to Christ, that's all Old Testament saints. Also, and again, the scriptures say it. We don't have time to run it all down, but it's there. All the church and all, as it says here, who believed in Christ during the tribulation. So this massive multitude of believers from all the Old Testament at, back to Adam and Eve, all the way up to the end of the tribulation. So again, the tribulation is going to end with this massive die-off of people and all kinds of people being killed, of course, at, the, at, the Arm, at Armageddon. There's also going to be a massive amount of people that pass out of the tribulation alive, not dead, and go into the millennial reign of Christ. There's been this huge um, administration change, maybe we could say that, from the Antichrist to the actual Christ. And now these people have passed from uh, terrible circumstances into the millennial reign of Christ, but they've not died in that process, and they've passed through that way, that gateway, with their entire uh, sinful natures intact. They didn't die. They're just like you, just like me. They enter into the millennial reign of Christ, and something very drastically changes about it. We're going to see in just a second. Not only does the administration change, but phys physically they're going to change. So you've got lions laying down with lambs and sheep running with wolves and all this kind of stuff. Never happened before. Also, human beings are going to be living much longer. In fact, mostly for the entire thousand years. So, so, but 
but anyway, back to this, back to what's happening here. So these are literal thrones. How do we know that? Because that's exactly what Jesus promised. Jesus promised that. Look at Matthew on the screen there. Matthew 19, verse 28. So who are sitting on these thrones? So Jesus said to them, As surely I say to you, that in the resurrection, the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on, the, sits on his throne of his glory, which is what? David's throne, which is where? On the earth, in Jerusalem. David never reigned anywhere else, neither will Jesus. Now, of course, he's reigning in heaven, of course, but his ultimate reign is going to be on earth. When the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Israel's a literal place, is it not? The apostles were literal people, were they not? So why would we think that the thrones are anything other than literal, and the reign of Christ is anything other than literal? Like I said, we, we, we are um, not, when we hold a position that's not literal, we're not thinking through very well. So if the twelve are going to be judging the tribes of Israel, who's going to be judging the rest of the planet and the other people who survived the tribulation? Do you know who they are? You're looking at them. You, are you ready to rule? The Bible's real clear that you're going to be doing that. So if you're not much on administration, you better, you know, take some classes or something. Now, you're going to be gifted by the Holy Spirit, but notice Revelation. Jesus already promised that. We've already seen that. This is the promise he made to the church, uh, the, the overcomers at least. He who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over what? Are you ready for that? Are you ready for that? My wife doesn't give me more than $10. But look, honey, that's no, not true. Look, honey, get used to running stuff because that's gonna, you're going to be enabled to do that, expect, expected to do that. In fact, one of the illustrations Jesus gives is this, he, he's this, as if he's this king and he leaves to his servants these talents, right? Gives them each a talent and he comes back to see how they did. And based upon how one servant turned one talent into ten talents, right? One into five, one into two, and then one buried in the backyard, right? The guy that turned it into ten, what did he do with him? Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in little. Be over much. He gives them ten cities. Why? Because that's the way Jesus operates. Because the, what, whatever, however much you have down here, the opportunities and talents and treasures and other things that you have, it's going to be small compared to the blessings that are headed for us and the responsibilities that are headed for us. Again, it would give him power over the nations. He shall, the, those, the, us, those will rule over them. He will rule over them with a rod of iron. They will dash into pieces like a potter's vessel. It's going to be, I don't know if you've ever been a governor or president before, but it's pretty rough. It's coming. It's the way it reads. As also I have received from my Father. How much, did he receive? How much authority did Jesus receive this morning? All of it. So he's granting it piece by piece to each one of us. And it will be absolute. Now the good news is, is that you're going to be in a non-sinful nature. You're going to be devoid of your sinful tendencies. It's going to be great. I wouldn't trust me with anything at this point. But, but a, a renewed bill with a new spirit and a new mind incapable of sin. Now that bill I would trust. I don't trust the current bill any further than I can throw it. But the new bill I really trust, and apparently so does Jesus. The new you is going to be responsible for a bunch of stuff because he's going to create you with the ability to handle all this. So it's, that's an amazing uh, prediction and prophecy. But these are all literal things. Israel's a literal country. Twelve apostles are literal people. The thrones are literal thrones. Earth is a literal, literal, literal place. The thousand years is a literal time period. There's no way around it. So let's go on over chapter 5, I mean chapter 20, Revelation, verse 5. And the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years we read that were completed. This is the first resurrection, and we've, we've seen who the first resurrections are. Verse 6, blessed and holy is the one who has part in the first resurrection. Over these the second death does not have power. So... So if you don't make it in the first resurrection, the second resurrection is not a good thing to be in. Because apparently those do have, or I should say the second death does have control over them. But the first resurrection does not. They will be, oh, by the way, it's all, resurrections happen to everybody, good or bad, heaven or hell, you're all going to be resurrected. It's not a matter, the good people get resurrected, the bad people don't. No, everybody gets resurrected. Hell's going to be a place of bodily experience, just like heaven will be, just like the earth will be. Over these, the second death has no power, 
they will be priests of God and of Christ, and will, there it is, reign with him for how long? Yeah, it's like, man, how many times have they got to say this for us to continue to write it off as something not literal? It's almost like, it's almost as if, notice the next verse, and when the thousand years were complete, it's almost like God predict, could see ahead of time how we were so quickly to write this off as something not literal, it's not that. When the thousand years are complete and Satan will be released from his prison, like he said, why do that? Well, because, well, tell me, tell me the reason why he's here in the first place, and I'll tell you the reason why he's let go in the second place. He's here in the first place because that's what we deserve. So when, when we choose, as Adam and Eve chose, to, instead of follow the Lord, they, they chose to follow a different word, the word of the devil, instead of the word of God. They chose, in the process, a dark Lord. So that's where we are today. Why don't we have a dark Lord over us? Because that's what we chose. That's what we, in, our, in our sinning, we choose a dark Lord. We're in rebellion. So we get a rebel as a king. That's the way God does things. So these that have passed out of, out of the tribulation into the millennial reign of Christ are still living, dying, giving birth to kids, populating the earth again for a thousand years. How big does the population get under pristine conditions? Jesus is reigning as king. Jesus is controlling all economies. Jesus is controlling the environment. Jesus is controlling food supply, oil supply, et cetera, et cetera. What's it going to be like? Better than today. A way better. So these people are going to be living. Watch. Let me show you this. Let's, let's, let's go take a look at this. Isaiah 65. The people during this time, this is not the resurrected people. You're going to be living forever. You're resurrected. You're part of the first resurrection. These people, though, are going to be living an unresurrected life for a long time. Notice the predictions here. Remember, what, remember before the flood? You ever read chapter 5 of Genesis? How long were these people living? Methuselah lives, what, 968 years? Adam lives 950 years, I believe. Moses lives like 960, something like that. Incredibly long times. That's, by the way, how close is 960 to 1,000? Well, it's right at it, isn't it? That is right at it. Isn't that interesting? Is that just coincidence? I don't think so. Isaiah, what did I say? Isaiah uh, 65. Notice, again, we're, we're consulting prophecy. God makes the prediction that things will be going back to the conditions as they were prior to the flood. There was something environmentally, genetically different about us prior to the flood because we lived a thousand years, roughly, and had kids that whole time. You may talk about family reunion problems. They had them. Isaiah 65, verse 19 through 25. So this is, again, the millennial reign of Christ. But be glad and rejoice... That's verse 18, I'm sorry. Be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem for rejoicing and her people for gladness. Why? Because that's where Jesus is going to be. And, and I will also rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. And there will no longer be heard in her the voice of weeping and the sound of crying. Why do people do that? Because people die. No longer will there be in it an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not live out his days. For the youth will die, notice, at the age of 100. When were they getting married? And remember chapter 5 of Genesis? They were not getting married and having kids until they were 100 or more. So we're, we're back. We reverted back to the pre, pre, pre-Diluvian days. Anti-Diluvian, I think is the correct way. The young will die at an age of 100. When has that happened recently? I haven't noticed that. And the one who does not reach the age of 100 shall be thought a curse. Oh, oh she only lived 100 years. Poor thing. And they shall not build houses, and, in, and, and they shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall also plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and others inhabit, because that's what happens when you pass away at 40, 50 years old, 60 years old. The stuff you've been amassing and building, you finally, by the time you get old enough to get smart enough to have some stuff, you die. <laughs> you've been dumb for so long, and then finally you figure out how to handle money, and then boom, you're gone, you leave it to your kids, and they throw it all away. That's not happening anymore. It says, they shall not plant and otherwise eat. For as the lifetime of a tree, so shall be the days of my people. Wow, we got trees here in Texas that are more than 1,000 years old. Trees in Israel that are more than 2,000 years old. Olive trees in the Garden of Gethsemane, more than 2,000. They are amazing. You've got to go with us. Dodge the bullets and just go. My, when are we going? This fall. Leaving this fall. My chosen ones shall wear out the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity. 
for they are their offspring. Uh, they are the offspring of those who are blessed by the Lord and their descendants with them. So there's this, it's, it implies this massive amount of time people are going to be living. And it doesn't say a thousand years, but it you know practically does. I mean, it says they're going to be living a really long time. It will come to pass that before they call, I will answer them, and while they're still speaking, I will hear them. The wolf hears this whole same scenario, this whole change of environment. The wolf and the lamb shall graze together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. The dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not do evil or harm in all my holy mountains, says the Lord. So here we have this longevity of life. We have, uh, so, but, but, but notice, interestingly enough, so the devil's released, and the reason why he is is because there's still sinners during this time. Because they entered the tribulation, they left the tribulation as sinners, and they continue to be tribul sinners. So even though we have a perfect government, perfect government, Jesus reigning, we have a perfect environment in which people are living a very long time. It still cannot, and no devil to deceive. You think certainly everybody's going to get saved in that condition. No, they're not. Because even all these things, as great as those things are, they do not conquer sin. You want to know what's wrong with the United States of America? Sin. That's what the problem is. It's just sin. It's sin. It doesn't matter who's, you know, Democrats, Republicans, all that. It, you know, it doesn't matter who's up there. It's because we are full of sinners that our problem is. That's where our problem is. You get rid of the sinners, it doesn't matter who's up there. Because if we're not sinners, they're following God and honoring Him with their life. You can put a name. I don't care what the name are. I'll vote for them. Because that's, 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 that's the solution for things, right? So, so you get rid of sin. But as long as you have sin, it doesn't matter what the circumstances. It doesn't matter the government. It doesn't matter the environment. It doesn't matter any of these things. Because, as I said, a thousand-year reign of Jesus, you would think it would fix everything. It does not. People are still sinners. So, so we have what happens, what precipitates now back in Revelation. So the devil is released after the thousand years. Satan is released from his prison. He will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, it refers to the far reaches of the north, to gather them together for the war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. Wow. That's not a testimony of the fallenness of a human heart and sin even though they've been a thousand years with Jesus, they still are ready to follow the devil as soon as they get a chance. It's amazing. It's amazing. And they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved cities, referring to Jerusalem. And the fire came down from heaven and devoured them. This is not the battle of Armageddon. That's already happened. This is another battle, battle a thousand years later. And the devil who deceived him was thrown into the lake of fire. So now the third resident in this lake of fire and brimstone now has, has come. Now the devil finally goes where the beast and the false prophet are also. They're already there. Been waiting on the devil. Now he's there. They will be tormented day and night forever and forever. And then now comes this great white throne. Now comes at the end of the millennial reign of Christ. Now comes this great white throne and the change uh, of what will, uh, what will take place here. So it says, And I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it, and whose presence earth and heaven fled away. Wow. And there's no longer a place. It's sort of a blow to the ecologist, don't you think? So we're trying to save the earth, and then God just you know, rolls it all up. Can the earth be saved? Ultimately, no. In fact, it's not worth saving. For behold, I create, and I'm all about limits and you know, taking care of the environment. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying it's a, it, ultimately a futile thing. For behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. That's the inevitability of the earth we live on. Jesus is coming to reign on the current earth for a thousand years, and at the end of that, he's, getting away, he's, getting, he's going to be doing away with all that. And so the earth is going to be done away with. Uh, to end with a little story here, as it's important. I think, you know, we come to, let's, let's, let's read the rest of this chapter because we're going to talk about it more next time. So now comes this great judgment. I saw the great white throne of him who sat upon it, whose presence earth and heaven fled away. And no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. So these didn't make it in the first resurrection. That's bad. The books were opened. And another book, singular, was opened the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the book. So we got a group of books over here and a single book over there. So they were judged what was written in there. What, what, was, what was written in there? All the stuff they ever did. God's a bookkeeper. He is. According to their deeds. You don't ever want to be in the line that says you get judged according to your deeds. Ever. Because you mess up one time, short of perfect, you're not going to make it. And that's where these people are. And notice, death and Hades, that's the center part of the earth, that's the Abuso, that's the, this Tartarus, they were thrown into the lake of fire, which is this outer darkness. This is the second death of the lake of fire, and anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. 
So we have this whole judgment scene. We're going we're gonna to deal with that next time uh, a little bit better just because of, for the sake of time here. But I want to just have a conversation with you about some things and our attitude toward people, especially with regards to judgment. Uh, anybody familiar with Muammar Gaddafi? Gaddafi, I'm sorry. You know who he is? <laughs> Muammar Gaddafi. Remember him? Uh, Ronald Reagan gave him, coined, coined the phrase, the mad dog of the Middle East. He actually wasn't Middle East. He was in North Africa, Libya. He was the king of Libya, the premier of Libya for a long time. Died October 20th, 2011. Very few people mourned his passing for all the right reasons. This guy was an absolute terror. He was horrible to his people. Uh, just really bad. 42-year reign of terror. Uh, made Libya a home for such notorious groups as the IRS, I mean the IRA. I confuse those. <laughs> I couldn't resist. I was right on it, yeah. Palestinian Black September, responsible for the 72 Munich Olympic massacre, if you'll remember that. Uh, those who were behind the Pan Am Flight 103 bombing, which killed 270 people, he, he, he allowed them to live in Libya. And, uh, in fact, supported them in, in, by all uh, estimations. He had uh, any resistance in his opposition among his people, both those who lived domestically and those who lived foreignly, had him murdered systematically. If you didn't like him, he had you killed. You were a Libyan. You had, to, you had a silent dotted line, or you, that was it for you. Just the way he rolled. Willingly, knowingly impoverished his people by refusing to expel these known terrorists and other groups, criminals, and thus incurring UN sanctions, which basically uh, kept the export of oil from Libya, except to other oil-producing Arab countries, which they didn't need the oil anyway, so these people were just impoverished. They just had horrible... Of course, he never went without food or anything, but a lot of his people did because of these sanctions. And so, uh, sad. Same thing happened in Cuba today for the same reasons. Uh, there was rejoicing on earth when he died, though, you could be sure. So let me ask you this question. Here's the question of judgment. Do you think there was rejoicing in heaven? We need to be real careful of our attitudes, making sure that we're there like the Father, because the Father describes himself here in Ezekiel. Uh-oh. Something happened. There he goes. I'll read it from over here. Do I have any pleasure at all that the wicked should die? In other words, does God get excited about that? There are a lot of people in Libya excited about this guy dying. And I understand. I understand. But does God, do I have any pleasure, God says, at all, that the wicked should die, says the Lord, and not that he should turn from his ways and live? That's what, you want to get God jazzed? That's what jazzes him, not people getting what they deserve. How do we know God feels that way? Because look at Jesus dying for our sins. He, he got, he's getting you in exchange for Jesus. I'm thinking he's getting ripped off. I really do. He's getting ripped off, getting me. But not, that's not the way God feels. God is willing to lay down the life of his one and only son to rescue criminals like, like this guy, Muammar Gaddafi even, if he would have only turned. As far as we know, he never did. That is the heart of God. When we look at judgment, we need to make sure we look at it from the perspective of, yeah, God's going to do it. It's going to be very thorough. It's going to be with omnipotence, but it's going to be the last thing that he wants to do. That's why it's the very last thing. We sit around and wait for God. To, why doesn't God kill that old guy? I mean, if I was God, I'd wipe him out. Yeah, you probably would. But you're not God. You don't think like him. You don't, you don't approach the world like him. And you better be glad that you're not God because you would kill you, have killed you a long time ago. You would have. So be glad that God is who he is and let's try our best to be like him when it comes to this. God doesn't, he's not excited when guys like this guy gets what's coming to them. It will happen. There will be judgment. There will be great judgment. Hell will be full of people. It really will. But it will be the last thing that God does. It's not what he wants. So, All right, we'll stop right there. Let's pray. God, we thank you again for teaching us. We thank you that we can understand these things and we can help, help us to assimilate your scriptures, which are a document. They're an entire body, and we have to take them as a whole and, and follow them, help us to get, uh, grow deeper and deeper into what they say, what they mean, and the directions they lead us, and especially grow deeper and deeper in our relationship uh, with you. Thank you, God, for this time. We pray your blessings over our understanding. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptistchurch.org.